um, put the program on and set the schedule and so on. And um, would like to report, I, I live close to the uh, library here in Oakland and would report, like to report to you that the air has improved. So it's simply unhealthy now. Mm -hmm. So that's an improvement. And I did get a, a text message from my uh, stepdaughter in Seattle, near Seattle, who told me that the air quality in Portland is 515, which is literally off the charts. I think dangerous ends at uh, 300 or something. So um, if you can breathe, uh, I'd be thankful for it. And just think about uh, the you know, what's happening elsewhere, not only climate wise, but uh, in other places like Belarus and around the world. So uh, let's keep that in mind. But uh, for right now, let me just uh, say a few things uh, about uh, our, our, our institute, the Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebel Proctor Marxist Library and about the library. Um, our library was named uh, in honor of two remarkable individuals, uh, Carl Niebel and Roscoe Proctor. Um, Carl Niebel was a noted Marxist economist and scholar who came to the United States in 1934 after escaping from Nazi Germany. He served in the New Deal and in the US Navy during World War II. Um, he survived the anti-communism of the McCarthy period taught at a number of universities before ending up at um, uh, San Jose State University in the early 1970s. When Niebel pa passed away in 1985, he asked that his very extensive library of books, pamphlets, and papers be made available to the public and named in honor of his wife, Elizabeth Hale Niebel, who was a leader in uh, public housing during the New Deal. Roscoe Proctor was born in Texas and moved to California in the 1940s. Particularly in the anti-Semitic government. And um, they also have had territory, which was once part, of once part of Poland, now part of Belarus. And they're quite interested in retrieving that as well. Um, this, if you can see my cursor, there is a, um, an entity here between Belarus and Lithuania that has no label on it. And perhaps in the question and answer period, someone um, could get extra credit by telling what country this might be that did not warrant a label. But this country here is labeled and that's the Ukraine to the south of Belarus. Ukraine, as we all know, had a US backed coup in 2014. And it was um, a coup that um, put in a, a government that is highly um, hostile to Be Belarus. And um, Ukraine is probably well on its way to becoming a member of NATO. So that if Estonia, Latvia, re Ukraine become a member of NATO, then Belarus is the last country on the Russian Western border not to be part of NATO. The strategy of the US-NATO alliance is to make it Belarus part of the NATO alliance and completely um, encircle the western border of Russia. Belarus has the nickname the last Soviet Republic. It's well deserved because at the, when the, the Soviet Union dissolved in around um, 1990, uh, the, um, all the Soviet republics with the, with the exception of Belarus went in a capitalist direction. The, uh, Russia under, under Yeltsin which sold out the shop and so on and so forth. But Belarus tried to preserve some of the Soviet, um, some, some, some of, the, of the things from the Soviet period. Belarus had not been a um, sovereign country actually until 1990. Um, but with the, um, the becoming sovereign, they elected Alexander Lukashenko president in 1994, and Lukashenko has been president of that country ever since. The, um, he ran for uh, re-election um, this year on um, August 19. Um, he won according to official results. That was his sixth term in office. And as you know, 
there has been protests around that election. When Belarus became a sovereign country, they rejected the Western imposed shock therapy, which imposed a neoliberalism, neoliberal regime on the other Soviet republics. And they retained a significant, to a significant degree, state-run industry, collective farms, to a certain extent, the social safety net, and the relative equality that was inherent in the socialist period. But right now, Belarus is in the midst of a color revolution. Right now, as we speak, there's um, demonstrations in Minsk that are advancing on what is being described in the mass media as a resonance where uh, Lukashenko is, is me and may not be in, but it's one of his residences. So what is a, a color revolution? Well, color revolution is a revolution that's based on legitimate grievances, on genuine discontent. There's no question about that. Um, what we do see in the color revolution is that we're living in a world that's dominated by a single superpower, that of course being the United States. And that these revolutions get hijacked by these outside interests and often become the opposite of what they intend to be. And a good example would be the solidarity movement in Poland where solidarity began to be a organization that put forward workers' rights and in the end was an organization that ended up destroying workers' rights. So right now, Belarus is in the midst of a color revolution. Which way it will go is unclear, but stakes are very, very high. Now, I want to start off not with Belarus, but actually with another Soviet Republic, Georgia which I visited in 2012. And I want to compare Georgia to Belarus. And just as an aside, why did I go to Georgia in 2012? Well, it wasn't for politics, it was for seeing birds. I'm a wildlife biologist, I'd like to see birds go around the world looking at them. And Belarus is a very, excuse me, and Georgia is a, a, a very important place to go because the birds that breed in um, Europe and Asia in the summertime, they then migrate south to Africa. And on their migratory route, they, they don't like to fly over water like the Black Sea, and they don't like to go over oceans like the Caucasus, or over mountains like the Caucasus. So when they get to the country of Georgia, they get very narrowly funneled right into the coast over a town called Batumi. And so I went down to Batumi to see the, this migration spectacular. And it's really one of the world-class natural spectaculars to see. I not only saw the birds, but I saw something that was kind of indicative of what a neoliberal theme park is like. What happens when a country becomes a capitalist country that was former socialist republic? This is at our, our hawk watching site. And just um, right before we got there, um, um, some hunters had killed some falcons and left their bodies there. Um, in fact, in the time I was there in Batumi, during daylight hours from the very moment of first light, you could hear rifle shots. And you heard rifle shots around Batumi continually, all day long, not, not just occasionally, but just all day long, everywhere you went. Because people were not only we were looking at the birds, but most of the people out there um, were, had their rifles and they were shooting and killing the birds. Some of them were doing it for sport. Others were doing it for, for food. Um, this picture here of this man with a rifle, I took at, of all places, the Batumi Botanical Garden. And I was looking at a very small bird. It was even smaller than a, a sparrow. And this guy jumped up, stood in front of me, shot the bird and ran up, killed it, put it in his pocket and walked away. Um, so that, that gives you kind of an idea of what happens to the conservation ethic when a neoliberal, neoliberalism takes root. And I'll, I'll mention an article I read in an international journal called Conservation Biology, which spoke about Georgia. And then in the Soviet period, they had this incredible conservation program where they 
conserved and studied endangered species. And they have a number of um, horned animals, uh, goats and sheep that were highly endangered. And they were protected and nurtured. When Georgia became capitalist, the Georgian government, of course, stopped the study, stopped the protection. But then they sold tags to hunt these endangered species to international trophy hunters. And they priced the tags on the basis of endangerment. So that if you, using the old Soviet period studies, so that if you wanted to kill a very, very endangered species, you had to pay a lot of money to, to, to that, for that tag. I didn't make that up and I didn't make up this, this billboard. When you get off the plane in Batumi, at least in 2012, what do you see? But you see a picture of Donald Trump. This particular billboard in 2012 said in five years time, Batumi will be the best city in the world, Donald Trump. I was kind of skeptical about that. But had that sign said, in four years time, I, Donald Trump, would be the president of the United States, I wouldn't have believed that at all. But speaking of presidents, if you go down to the capital of um, Georgia, and it's called Tbilisi, it's something like that. And don't go by my pronunciation of, of, of Georgian words. In fact, don't even go with my pronunciation of English words. But in the capital of Georgia, there is a bronze statue of Ronald Reagan. And not only that, but they have made the main avenue in the capital city, they renamed it the George Bush Avenue. When you go to the cities in Georgia, the major cities, they're just a hot house of incredible construction of these luxury, crazy buildings, uh, just incredible. Uh, coming in on the plane, I sat next to a economist from one of the largest engineering countries in the world, uh, companies in the world. And he said that in Georgia, there was being flooded with international loans. And then he added, there is no way that they could ever pay them back. They'll be in debt peonage forever. The countryside, in, on the other hand, in this neoliberal clean park is impoverished. You can see in the left panel, um, three people and five scraggly cows, a very hard way to make a living, uh, these ter terribly um, emaciated cows. The right panel shows a woman that probably should be home playing with her great grandchildren. Instead, she's doing hard labor. So that's Georgia. Let's get to my Belarus. I went to Belarus in 2014. And again, I went there to see the nature. Belarus is the most well-preserved natural state in all of Europe with no other country in Europe coming even close. 40% of Belarus is forested. Not only that, but um, the animals like these animals, these are European bison and probably most of you never even heard of European bison, because for the most part, they're extinct in most of Europe, but they still range freely in the major reserves and parks in Belarus. They're well studied and well cared for. And as a biologist, I can tell you that babies come from storks and the population in Belarus is just under 10,000 people, uh, 10 million people, it's a small country. It's mostly urban with only about uh, 20% in, in the rural area. And if you notice with this uh, right panel, there's a band on the stork. So even in the remote um, rural areas, there is scientific studies going on right now in Belarus. The languages in Belarus are 70% Russian and 23% Belarusian. Uh, and these statistics, by the way, come from the CIA World Factbook. So they're not cooked in favor of a Russian connection to Belarus. In fact, the, if you ever read that, the uh, blog, the Saker, um, he says Belarusians basically are Russians. This particular picture, I wanted to contrast to the Georgian picture. 
of five people, of, uh, three people and five cows. This one man is, um, has a huge herd of cows which he's taking care of. And these are very, very um, healthy, high producing milk cows. What is hard to see in this picture, but it's fairly visible, is that there's a wire here. And I want to uh, explain what that's about. Because um, what we have here is an example of pulse grazing. And this is a very advanced technique of, of grazing. I had learned about it in graduate school when I took range ecology uh, course. Um, what it is, is that the cows are herded in a fence, an electric fence, which is moved daily, and they're moved over these vast, lush, great pastures. And they intensively graze one spot for a while and then move on. And the advantage of that is that it mimics the natural ecology of a grazing herd. And it's supposed to be healthier for the cows and for the rangeland. So back here in California, where I live, um, a dairy farm typically is kind of a messy melange of manure and flies and mud because the cows have to come back to the, to the barn every day to get milk. In this situation, they have a portable milking array that follows the cows. So rather than the cows coming to the barn, metaphorically, the barn goes to the cows. So it shows the advantage of having a planned socialist type um, agriculture that the Belarusians have. The typical of, of most rural areas is that mostly there's uh, a large percentage of older people. Um, this is some of the Belarusian um, houses, very, very pretty wooden houses, fancily painted. Even the um, work on this drain pipe is quite attractive. And as every village has a cemetery, cemeteries too are quite attractive. They have lots of flowers on them. And if you notice, it's typical there to have the headstones with um, photographs of the deceased. In terms of religion, um, almost half the country is Orthodox, 48%. Interestingly, 41% are non-believers. And this picture takes a, a, is of a lover's fence, and probably you've seen them. They're, they're all over the world. They're, they're a situation where two people that are in love uh, write their names on a lock, put it on the fence, and, and then throw away the key in, as a symbol of their commitment to each other. But the reason why I put this uh, picture in, even though it's from Bel um, Belarus, is to tell a story about um, my friend Zoya, um, and I am a retired wildlife biologist who worked for an environmental consulting firm, and Zoya worked there too as a botanist. Zoya was from um, Leningrad, and she has a PhD in, in botany, and during the Soviet period, she worked in Leningrad as a research botanist. And then when the restoration of capitalism came to, to Russia, all those research jobs were, were ended, and she came to the United States. So one day we were going out to a project site. We were in um, Sonoma County. And I asked Zoya, what was it like when they changed from, capital, from socialism to capitalism? And she said, fences. Well, at first I thought I misunderstood her because what did fences mean? So she said, well, before there weren't any fences, but then fences went up everywhere and you couldn't walk around. You were always inside fences. And we were passing a, um, a area in Sonoma County, which was wealthy and they had these, these big estates. And so I pointed out the window of the car and I said, well, Zoya, do you mean that you could walk on an estate property like that? And she said, well, of course, you'd, you'd have to be well behaved. You couldn't do vandalism, but yes, you would be free to do that. And I realized that of all the th sort of many things that you lose when you lose a socialist type economy and society and polity is that you lose this thing about public property. 
and that the whole idea of private property and the legitimacy of fences was something that I had sort of internalized, but that there is an alternative out there. Um, to get back to Belarus, uh, housing is um, in the urban areas and mainly high rise housing. Uh, the one apartment that we did visit was a, a, a modest apartment, but quite nice. Um, as far as we could see, that there was no homelessness. That doesn't mean there wasn't any, but it wasn't visible like we have here at home. Um, the city of Minsk is the capital. Uh, the left hand panel is a the circus museum, a Ferris wheel, and a um, on the right is a ornamental thing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Jewish heritage because um, Belarus is a major, um, was a major country and area for, for European Jew Jews. Amongst the Belarusian Jewish expats that are famous is the ILGWU leader, David Dubinsky. Um, three Israeli prime ministers and Israel first president came from Belarus as did the composer Irving Berlin and the artist Mark Chagall. And then a number of luminaries that we probably know about have Belarusian Jewish parents or grandparents, and these include actors Kurt Douglas and Harrison Ford, the economist Paul Krugman, the linguist Noam Chomsky, and at the other end of the ideological spectrum, the author Anne Rand, and even Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, comes from a Belarusian Jewish background. Other luminaries include um, our moderator for this today, Alan Miller, and myself, who became, who, who have Belarusian Jewish relatives. But I wanted to talk, oh, and then I should say that we're, we're wearing the hats of, of the Belarusian state, and Belarusian state colors are the green and red with the, the white. And so when you see the demonstrations here that are taking place um, for the last 35 days in Belarus, and you see the white and red and white, it's a little bit jarring because those were the flags, they're not the national flags of Belarus. Those were the flag that was flown during the Nazi period. Now the flag has the antecedents back to 1918, but nevertheless, it does have that taint of the flag that was flown during the Nazi collaborationist period. And I wanted to mention a little bit about that. And I asked my friend, Stan Kastner, he's a doctor in New York City and a Latin American solidarity activist. And he also had relatives from Belarus. And I asked Stan to tell me a little bit about his family and I'm gonna read this because he wrote about his family. My grandmother's family was um, from a small town in Southern Belarus. The town had approximately 3,000 Jews before the German army entered in July of 1941. One month later, 220 men, including so-called intellectuals, were rounded up. Our relative, a school teacher, was one of the intellectuals chosen. They were taken by a truck to a nearby forest and shot in a pit. One year later, on May 12, 1942, the German authorities rounded up Jews and ordered all Jews to come to the central square. 2,300 Jews including children under the age of 14, were selected to be shot in a pit outside the town. Two young girls in our family, 11 and 12 years of age, were selected for the slaughter. Their childhood friend told me that unlike her, the girls were too small to fake the age of 14 in order to avoid the selection. The, the participants in the slaughter were the SS Germans, Polish police and Lithuanian soldiers. The Lithuanian soldiers shot the Jews in a pit with a machine gun. On the same day, my elderly great-grandmother refused to leave her bed 
you come to the central square. A German soldier searched the houses for people who stayed behind. Upon seeing my great grandmother in our bed, the German soldier shot her in the chest. My two cousins in our family in their early 30s joined a Jewish partisan group in the forest. A Soviet paratrooper was sent into the partisan area in order to make contact. The Soviet paratrooper trained them, these two cousins, how to use explosives in order to blow up railroad tracks. Fortunately, both survived the war. The Great War, as I call it, the Great Patriotic War, what we call World War II, is, was very, very hard, not only on the Jews of Belarus, but on all the people. They lost a major portion of, that, of their population to the Nazis. And every day, every year, they celebrate Independence Day, which is the day that the Red Army liberated Belarus. And the old veterans are venerated. The children come out and hear the stories about the war. And there, in that country, war is not glorified. Peace is glorified because they know what the horrors of war are. This is Victory Square, which commemorates the um, victory over the Nazis with the red and green symbols of the nation. And this is Victory Square just a few weeks ago when there was a huge demonstration. Tens of thousands of people were out there protesting against the government, as many as 200,000, some estimated. Now, you can't have a demonstration of this magnitude without there being legitimate grievances and deep felt discontent. The demonstration were responded, the um, security forces, particularly in the beginning, responded aggressively and violently. And um, this is a picture of some of the Belarusian uh, security forces that were used to put down the demonstrations. But I wanted to pause for a moment, not to defend them, but to put them into a context and to point out, point out that at the same time, back here in the United States, we also were having major demonstrations. And we also were having security forces um, violently um, hurting our people. And I think it's instructive to pause because sometimes when we look at a foreign country, we can see insights into what our country is like. So here we have the Belarusian security forces and if you notice, they aren't armed. On the other hand, we look at this, this policeman from Portland that was just taken a few weeks ago. And we see that short of thermonuclear tactical weapons, he's armed to the teeth with lethal weapons. And it's not even, and, and we have the situation where um, our park rangers are even armed with lethal weapons. And you, you look at the uh, Belarusians and they are look mean and ugly and vicious and they probably are, but they aren't armed with lethal weapons. Two people um, were reported killed in the Belarusian demonstrations, but at home too, we've had a, any number of police murders. Um, as it turns out, people of color have been particularly targeted, but having white skin doesn't make you any more bulletproof either. And when we call, if when people accuse the Belarusian government of being a brutal dictatorship, what would we call our own country in comparison? And when we say that the Belarusian, or when the press says that the Belarusian system must be changed, what would we say about our own system? So I just wanted to make that comparison and go on with the story about Belarus. So there's been demonstrations on both sides. 
if you read the mainstream press, it's very hard to find out anything about the pro Lukashenko demonstrations, um, but they are taking place. And it's even harder to find a photograph of them, but I did, did find this, this, this particular photograph. If you compare the two photographs of the pro and the anti Lukashenko demonstrations, there's a slight demographic difference between the two constituencies. The pro Lukashenko constituency tends to have more older people, and the anti Lukashenko demonstrations tend to have more younger people. And I think you could see that in these photographs. In addition, the uh, pro-Lukashenko people, and it's hard to see that in the photograph, but we know that their um, main strengths are in the, the traditional industrial working class. And the anti-groups, their main strength is amongst the white collar professionals, particularly those in the high tech industry. And here is President Alexander Lukashenko um, right after a demonstration. He did this photo op. He was wearing a black flak jacket and carrying an automatic rifle. Uh, the press says that the, 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 it didn't have an ammunition clip on it, which was, I guess, fortunate for everybody. Um, but his response to these demonstrations has been that he is a defender of Belarus and will defend against the demonstrations. In the um, election that took place on August 9th, there um, were four major opposition candidates. According to official results, Lukashenko won with 80% of the vote, and Svetlana Tishkanuskaya, um, and I'll just call it Svetlana um, from here on in, which is what the press here calls her. Um, she, according to official results, got 10% of the vote. The vote was highly contested. Um, opposition sources said that in fact, Lukashenko got only 3% of the vote and that Svetlana got 70% of the vote. A, um, one opposition source actually did exit interviews. The exit interviews were done, uh, voting exit, exit um, interviews. And the exit interviews were done by actually two um, cadre from two NGOs that were supported by the United States. They um, projected that based on the exit data that Lukashenko won by 61.7%. But in any case, nobody really knows who won for sure if you question the official results. Uh, for sure there's a genuine opposition. Um, and Svetlana got, was the leading opposition candidate um, shortly after the election, she fled to Lithuania. There she met with the high-ranking U.S. official, uh, U.S. Undersecretary of State. She later went on to address the U.N. Ge uh, Se Security Council, calling for sanctions against her own people. Uh, Svetlana um, had no prior political experience before becoming the can a candidate. Her husband was the original candidate, who was a popular blogger, but he was arrested and she took over. And she describes herself as apolitical, but on a YouTube video, she now says she's ready to lead the Belarusian nation. And indeed, she has all the qualifications for a Western puppet president. She is photogenic and speaks English well. So what is the program of the opposition. If you read the mainstream press, it, they tell you that it's just about democracy. They're out there for democracy and freedom. But there's actually a published program of the, that was put together by a coalition of the main opposition parties, and it's called the Resuscitation Reform Package. And the purpose of the Resuscitation Reform Package, and this came out, um, was published actually even before the election, as it would, one would expect. And the purpose of the, the thrust of the resuscitation reform package is a complete and total transformation of Belarus, a transformation from a Eastern orientation to a Western US NATO orientation, and a change of, in the economy from a planned 
and semi-socialist type economy to a complete neoliberal economy. The major aspects of this uh, package is withdrawal from the union state with Russia and withdrawal from all other structures where Russia is prominent and to join the European Union and NATO, the privatization of all state enterprises and to sell the enterprises to create a thorough mixed economy. The purchase of the auctioned off state enterprises would be barred by, from Russia, but would be opened up to the Western interests. And I, just a, a little pause here to say that um, what the press talks about is how um, in the various Soviet, former Soviet republics that, where there was privatization, they talked about how the oligarchs took over. Um, and here we have a situation where the oligarchs, so-called oligarchs, could take over, as well as Western financiers. The language here is important because the inference is, is that only Slavic people have oligarchs, and that people like Gates or Soros, those people aren't oligarchs, they're financiers, or even sometimes the press calls them philanthropists. Back to Belarus, the Russian media, along with scientific and cultural exchanges, would be suppressed, and then Russian TV would be banned and replaced with Latvian, Lithuanian, Polish, and Ukrainian TV. And even the Belarusian Orthodox Church would become the new church replacing the Russian Orthodox Church. So that's the program of at least some elements within the opposition. Lukashenko for himself um, has played a game of triangulation between the East and West, um, trying to play one against the other. Um, this was what um, Gaddafi did and was a bad career choice for Gaddafi and for Libya and may end up being a bad career choice for Lukashenko himself. In February of this year, Mike Pompeo visited Lukashenko and in April of this year, the United States uh, reestablished diplomatic relations with Belarus. On the other hand, and this um, Belarus is very, very close to Russia and this picture of um, Lukashenko and Putin making eyes at each other is just priceless. Uh, I won't comment any further on that. The, the United States policy in Belarus is that of regime change. The United States um, has sanctions against Belarus. Um, the sanctions, according to the UN, um, are more correctly known as unilateral coercive measures, which are illegal under international law. According to the US Treasury website, the United States, in order to make these, uh, these, these sanctions, had to have the president in, um, declare that Belarus, quote, constitutes an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States, thereby create, hereby create a national emergency. Now this, takes reality and stands it on the head, on its head. Because Belarus is the country that is being challenged and is under a national emergency. And it's the United States, which is an unusual and extraordinary threat to its national security. And I should add even more so um, the UAE, the, the European Union countries are threatening Belarus. We go to the USAID website. The USAID is the above ground face of the CIA. And we see what they haven't plan planned for Belarus. Quote, USAID works to assist Belarus in its transition to a more democratic and free market oriented society. The USAID assistance targets the following sectors and they list civil society, women, media and so, and so forth. And they all actually list um, 37 different funded projects in Belarus that are designed to, quote, make the transition. Now, could you imagine if, let's say, Cuba had the ability to spend millions of dollars each year over a long period of years 
and had on their website, the Cuban government is assisting the American people to make the transition from capitalism to a more humane socialism. You, you get the point. So let me conclude now with just um, a little statement about what the future might be, which is very uncertain, and who has the key to the future. Uh, the, well, really, there's two keys. There's one key, which is the outside interference. And I would suggest that the outside interference is what we can do to help the Belarusian people by ending outside interference so that the Belarusian people themselves can determine their own destiny. And in particular, talking about the working people of Belarus. The Belarus has a large industrial working class. They have large industrial um, factories, uh, fact, um, tractors, fertilizer, a number of other heavy industrial products. And while some of the industrial workers have walked out and strike against Lukashenko, for the most part, the workers in these factories have stayed on the job and they haven't walked out. A wildcat strike by these workers could bring down the government in a heartbeat. But these workers understand and they look around and they see what happened in the other Soviet republics. They look at Ukraine particularly, which is now the poorest country in Europe, where it's having tremendous physical uh, uh, economic problems. They see what happens when capitalism is restored fully. Um, and, I, I, and I'm not in, implying that Belarus is a socialist country. It has elements of a socialist country. But when capitalism is restored fully, what happens is that the industrial enterprises, the state-owned enterprises, are sold to the lowest bidder. They are, the, the workforce is downsized. The factories are ransacked. People are um, losing their jobs. And all labor rights are abrogated. So right now, for the working people, of Belarus, which I think is what our focus should be. It shouldn't be on Lukashenko, but what the working people must do. That is the choices that they have. It's not a very good choice, and we want to see what the future brings. And with that, I will send, uh, turn this back on to Alan. Okay, thank you, Roger, for a very informative presentation. Uh, I think what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to transition to the question and answer period. But before we do, uh, I'd like to turn it back over to Jean. And uh, Jean, if you want to um, talk a little bit about the uh, ICSS program and um, fundraising. Okay. Uh, well, I don't have too much to say. First of all, um, we do not have anything specifically planned for next week, but by um, uh, the end of our meeting, we will have, tomorrow, uh, we will have something. So rest assured, we will have a program next week. We're not sure what it is. And I doubt that we'll live up the high standard that uh, Roger has set for us. Really good uh, program, Roger. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, give, 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 give a hands up. Uh, reactions, hands up, right. Thumbs up. Yeah. So um, I just want to say that about coming programs. But, but after that, we do have David Bacon is going to speak on uh, labor and immigration. Many of you know Labor Bacon as uh, know his photographs, if not him. So uh, he'll be with us and showing some photos, I'm sure. And um, we, we continue. So we do have a program and you can see always see our program uh, on our website. Uh, ICSSmarks.org. And you can also see our fund appeal. Uh, Richard isn't here, and I think I was banned from making the fund appeal because I used the soft sell method. Uh, I'm <laughs> like, uh, you know, Einstein, who had more important things to think about than money. And I, I, I like to take that as my motto. But we do Richard need this is here. Um, He's here. We, say again? Richard is here. Oh, Richard is here. Okay, well then uh, I will 
uh, recognize uh, the fact that uh, I'll just turn it over to Richard. Well, um, hey, there he is. I have the same uh, uh, disability as Gene that I uh, I've been criticized for the soft approach. So people will have to uh, um, imagine a, a more uh, rip roaring fundraising appeal. Um, we need money, um, uh, especially to I increase the the the, um, the reach of our programs. Um, we're getting we're getting people watching from around the world, um, around the country, but it it takes some resources to uh, to put it put these things together to to even to even mailing a mailing list to cost money. Um, uh, our new, we're going to, we're developing a new website and so on. So these are exciting times for ICSS. Um, but in order to uh, complete these activities, we, we need some money. Um, uh, a couple of people have been, particularly Gene, have been really carrying uh, our programs financially and we can't expect that to continue. Um, you know, we can squeeze them just so much and um, mm -hmm. I think they need a break. So I hope everybody will, will make a contribution. Um, uh, we have a um, method through PayPal and uh, we have the old mat fashion mat methods. Uh, I, if you look at our, um, our uh, email, you'll see how, how, how to do it. And I think we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll also, uh, Add the information on the chat. It may already have been added, yeah, but I no, it hasn't. But I'll add it uh, right now, and it'll be easy for you to make a contribution. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Okay, so um, any other uh, uh, Gene? Did you have anything else you wanted uh, to add? Uh, or? Okay, can Gene just uh, remind people yeah. that we are a grassroots organization? We get no money. Uh, we neither accept or they don't offer us any money from foundations or government agencies and so forth. Uh, so that um, it, it, we do rely on support from uh, our people here. So I just want to remind people of that. That's my hard sell. So okay. uh, we, uh, we can shift back to uh, comments and Q&A. And I think, Alan, if you... Okay. Uh, just a, a quick uh, reminder to everybody that we are recording the session, including the question and answer period, uh, just uh, for your information. We'll, we'll be turning that off at the end of that period. Um, the way I'd like to do this is if people would go to their participants window by clicking on the participants icon in the, at the bottom of your Zoom window, you can raise your hand uh, by clicking on uh, raise hand at the bottom of the participants window. And I will call on people uh, uh, basically in order for uh, uh, of how people raise their hands. So why don't we start off? We have uh, Yusef, you're, you're on first. And um, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And if you would go ahead and uh, state your question or comment, we're going to keep it to about two minutes. Um, Yusuf, why don't you go ahead and start? Okay, uh, thank you. Do uh, you hear me okay? Um, uh, yes. Now, I think the, um, the reason of these color revolutions, I think, uh, could be uh, boiled down to saying that they are the result of the contradiction of uh, uh, or introducing some capitalism uh, a, a, into a, uh, a state run by uh, state capitalist or socialist interests. I think I could summarize it like that, my opinion, and I'd like to get uh, feedback on that. I've also commented that another in character, Jewish uh, 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 a, 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 a political figure from uh, Minsk uh, uh, before World War One and during World War One was, I think, Pavlus. Uh, he was a, a, the, a Jewish. He 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 went to uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire and 
uh, was influential in the uh, uh, see, setting up uh, the, the, the constitution of the Young Turk resistance. And mm. also he brokered uh, the deal between Germany and Lenin, uh, allowing Lenin to uh, uh, enter Russia uh, because Lenin was uh, ending R Russian involvement in World War I quite correctly. So uh, those are my two comments. Uh, I'd like some feedback, uh, uh, especially on the uh, first. So the, the first was on um, state capitalism. Was that do uh, I understand? He, yes, I, I, the result of contradictions between introducing capitalism uh, within a state run uh, a, that's ostensibly a socialist or a state capitalist. You know, I, I would actually ask you to answer that question because it sounds like it's really, um, the, the question really has an answer behind it by, by, by raising that. So, uh, so what, 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 what did you want to bring out with that? Well, well, well okay, you get, uh, it brought in the uh, example of Soldarnosc, uh, uh, Poland, uh, it was uh, uh, one of the countries uh, that went furthest uh, producing markets uh, within a, a socialist uh, a country, and I think they couldn't handle uh, the contradict correctly the contradictions that resulted uh, from introducing uh, a, a market in a uh, under a socialist state, uh, and. Uh, 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 well, Belarus is also uh, an example because um, uh, I believe lately, actually, uh, 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 the uh, the government, uh, we, I, I don't want to personify it by Lukashenko uh, entirely, uh, introduced, uh, I think, more uh, privatization, actually. And I think he the contradictions uh, that resulted from that. Uh, a, resulting in uh, people uh, going over to the, uh, 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 blaming uh, the, uh, uh, the hardships introduced by uh, introducing market economy, some limited market economy, uh, uh, and uh, uh, blaming the hardships. Uh, he, he was given the blame. Uh, we, rather than uh, uh, the, the, the market uh, itself. So it, uh, they, they, uh, they took a, the, uh, the drawing the uh, wrong lesson, basically. Uh, so, uh, so that's my analysis. Uh, and I think it's also a Venezuela uh, example, I mean, Venezuela is building socialism uh, while maintaining uh, the, the not entirely abolishing uh, with one uh, stroke of the pen as Lenin did uh, 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 the, uh, the capitalist sector. So uh, I think that Roger, uh, did you Roger, did you have any comment on that? I'll go on to the next question. I, I, I think that Joseph presented a position that that's. Um, one that's very worthy of, of, of consideration, but let's let's go on to the next one. Okay, so the next person to call on is uh, we have two Richards in the queue: Richard Fallenbaum and then Richard, uh, then Orion, and then Richard Wright. So, uh, Richard Fallenbaum, I'm unmuting you, and if you would yeah. uh, ask your question. Well, just a comment. Uh, I think of, uh, I think it was a very wonderful presentation. Uh, a couple of comments. One, I think one needs to be very careful about using any sources, even photographs, to indicate th about the size of the demonstrations. We don't even know those, those photographs are genuine of these demonstrations. Um, everything is fixed. But I think there's a more basic question that is raised. Uh, you know, the, the, certainly there is, um, we have to ask why is the the sort of high-tech intellectual sectors become um, a source for opposition. And I think it's to do with the fact that there is a, there is a world market 
for um, labor power. It's a, it, it, it scans, spans the whole world, particularly in certain industries, which are, which are fungible across national borders. That is, if there is a, there is a, a, a wide variation in wages between high, the, the, the wages of high-tech workers in Silicon Valley and the high tech work, same high tech workers in uh, whether it's Russia, the Soviet Union, Cuba, Belarus, or Venezuela, there is going to be pressure, and um, uh, it's it's very hard to deal with because these countries want to, the socialist countries want to maintain certain egalitarianism, and um, uh, the, the, you know the, these. These uh, the workers themselves, to a certain extent, will will be patriotic, but it's, there are certain sectors of them which will be completely. Um, they'll go. They'll, they want to go where the money is. So um, uh, this is what's happening in places like Belarus, and even to some extent in Cuba, it's happening. I understand. Um, uh, at any rate, so. Um, China has attempted to deal with that problem by actually providing high income, providing uh, a world-class wages for those those sectors in China, and uh, even for the entrepreneurial class. Um, it, it needs to be studied a little more. So, anyway, that's my comment. Thanks. Yeah, I, I would say. Um, in reference to your first comment about getting reliable news sources, it's it's, it's very very difficult, um, and this was it was difficult. I, I've been interested in Belarus for a long time, but to find out just um, whether reliable sources is very difficult. Um, I I found actually actually um, kind of the most useful sources in terms of actually analysis there are the various communist parties in Europe. And um, I, I found the Greek Communist Party was very helpful. I found the uh, uh, Austrian and, and Spanish Communist Party is also very interesting. And it, it, and, it, and it relates back to Josef's comment that there, there are contradictions between, you know, socialist forms and capitalist forms that are very hard to resolve. And even within those communist parties, there is this conflict about whether to support um, Lukashenko as a kind of a lesser evil, or whether to say he should be doing something different. And really the question is, is there a potential in, the, in this world to do something different? Um, are there, is, is the deck stacked such as that, there, that you could move into a more socialist direction given the geopolitical situation in, in um, Belarus? Um, that, that that's the, that, that that's the really big question. Uh, so, Alan, you know, back to you. Yeah. Um, next will be Orion. I've asked you to unmute, followed by uh, Richard Wright and um, Michael K. And if you want to ask a question, raise your hand. Orion, can you? Uh, yes. You've been can unmuted. You there you go. Um, it's right to rebel. And it's really what they call slippery ground when you start attacking people that are rebelling. Um, there's a, Steve Zeltzer put out an interview. He interviewed somebody on Zoom, two people, leaders in Belarus. And uh, I learned a lot uh, from that. And a lot of my comments are probably based on that. And uh, one woman had just got out of jail and she was part of the 10,000 private uh, union that was started, uh, their tech workers apparently. And you might know about it. There's 4 million workers that are under the state unions and there's 10,000 workers that have their own union. And they're one of the main forces. Also, I think there's a bit of an apologist for the police they've shot, killed, <coughs> Uh, tortured, and the only reason those women were running for office was that all their husbands were jailed, okay? It was a four-day internet 
shutdown of that country by Lyshenko. I can't even say his name. And uh, the Duran program, I don't know whether you've seen that. They're, they're very, uh, pretty pro-Russia. And they were saying that Lyshenko is probably going to go. And Lyshenko actually arrested 33 uh, Soviet soldiers this summer sometime, I think it was. So he's been playing a really dangerous game. I don't, I hate neoliberalism, but I think that it's really important to support the masses. It's just like the Black Lives Matter. I just finished with this. And then maybe you can uh, answer maybe that question about the internet. And I'm really glad you told me about the resuscitation refer package because because in the video that I saw, that they said that the workers were not for NATO and that nobody in Belarus was for NATO or, uh, you know, so, uh, but uh, I lost some track of thought now. <laughs> Should have wrote better notes. Okay, but, um, so it's been uh, two minutes. Go ahead, if you have anything to finish. Oh, I didn't, hear the, I didn't hear the buzzer. No, no, that's okay. Go ahead, two minutes now, but anything else? Oh, oh, uh, yeah, just uh, let me take a breath. Here. All right, let me, let me go oh, ahead and check that Oh, and Duran, yeah. Duran, it's very important to check out Duran and very important to check out uh, Labor Video Project. And uh, there's a, it's about an hour interview and it's kind of the other side of the question, but it's okay. right to rebel and we have to support the working class. That's the main thing. And the working class person that was interviewed had just got out of jail and the police have been extremely brutal. And uh, where are these people going to turn to? Well, right now they don't really have a revolutionary movement, right? Oh, I wanted to mention Black Lives Matter. There's a multiracial rebellion of millions for Black Lives Matter. We want to change uh, that into the, a world revolution struggle. Uh, all right. It's the same way. With, Let's, we have three other Okay, I want to just say that. Okay. And yeah. because of Belarus, I think we have to do the same thing with them. We have to support them with criticism. And yeah. we have to understand yeah. that they're fighting this government that I don't think is for the interest of the people. They shut down the internet for four days. <laughs> I don't know, man. How can you support a Roger, government do you shut wanna, down the internet? You want to you want to comment, Roger? Yes, if I if I could, please. Thank yeah, you, ahead. Ryan, for those. And comments. then Richard Wright will be after. Go ahead, Roger. So um, right right now the internet is again being shut down as as we speak in in Belarus, and there is um, some fairly, fairly graphic repression of of, of demonstration. The, the real question is how we as activists in the United States can support. Um, a, a, a movement. And what we have to understand is it's a multi-tendency movement. Um, and the leadership is not always the same as the followers. And we have to look at some of the historical examples. Um, what I've come to conclusion is that the most important thing that we can do is have our country not interfere in Belarus because we live in the belly of the beast and that is our primary responsibility. Um, I, I think it's a little dangerous when you get into um, trying to support one current within the country when you're an outsider, especially the lack of information. Um, um, but the main thing I think we have to look at is what is the alternative? And that is a really big question like a number of people uh, had very justified criticisms of Gaddafi in Libya. Um, but what was the alternative? The alternative now is that there's open slavery in Libya, that there's various warlords fighting each other, that um, the, the wealthiest country in Africa is now one of the poorest ones, and that the whole hope of African unity has been destroyed. So. It's not just simply that um, Lukashenko is a bad guy, he's a bloody dictator. We have to look at what is the alternative. And do we want another Ukraine? Do we want another um, Poland? Do we want another Hungary or Bulgaria, Lithuania? 
those are the questions that have to be addressed and it, they aren't easy questions. Um, and at, at best I'm, I'm raising questions. I'm not really giving solutions other than get the US imperialists off the neck of the, the peoples of the world. Uh, Richard Wright, uh, if you would go ahead and then followed by Michael K. R.S. and then Sharon. So Richard, you want to go ahead? You're unmuted. Uh, well, uh, you just answered one of my questions, uh, uh, which is what we in the United States can do. Um, I had a couple of other questions. Uh, you you demonstrated you showed a slide that had about USA. Uh, clearly, these color revolutions are being. Uh, Sponsored and supported, and uh, uh, by uh, other by other groups than just just the USA, uh, National Endowment for Democracy, for example, and presumably the CIA is in there. Uh, so, one question I had was: aside, uh, well, I, I assume that they have some information about U.S. involvement other than USA, and secondly, what. Um, uh, what other, uh, for example, English or German or French uh, agencies are engaged in the color revolution uh, that, that we may not be normally aware of? The second question I had was, uh, I heard that Putin had, uh, had struck a deal with Lukashenko. Um, and um, would you know what that deal was and and who who got what out of out of out of that deal? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. On the, the first question, I can plead the ignorance. Um, the, the sources I've read um, on Belarus says that the U, the European Union U, European um, Union is more active than the United States in terms of interference in Belarus, and there's um, a lot of um, inter interference, particularly from Poland. There's an article in today's um, counterinsurgency, um, help me, Gene, counterinsurgency magazine. Is that it? Uh, 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 I, I forget. Just one, I, I have it on my screen, actually. Um, it's, um, I don't have it on my screen. So there's, 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 there's a, lot, a, a fair amount of, of that with the, the various countries, Lithuania, too. Um, but I, I don't really have those those statistics on my my fingertips. Um, and the second question, I'm sorry, Richard, but you're still muted. He was asking about other countries that are involved in uh, the EU. Uh, I think whether I answered, you knew anything about that. I think I answered that um, as best as, as best I could. Okay. In, inadequately, but I think he had a second one. Well, if it if it if it did get to passed up, uh, actually, Richard, if you would, I'll put you up again. But let's go ahead to uh, Michael K. Michael, you're muted. I've asked you to unmute. Followed by R. S. Sharon, and then Eugene Rule. So, Michael K., are you there? Looks like he is not unmuting. I'm so here. I'm, go oh, I'm you here. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, this is actually Susan. I was oh, in okay. the picture. You can. I'm okay. waving at you. Um, I have two questions, Roger. Thank you, Roger, for your presentation. Um, I I'd like to know more, if you know more, about people's grievances. <clears throat> in the, the group of folks who are, you know, the protesting against the government. That's the first question. Are they economic, aside from democracy and whatever that means, but economic or whatever. And the second is, um, is there activity in the U.S. to uh, pursue what you're talking about, uh, about changing U.S. behavior? Thank you. Roger, comment? Excuse me, I was taking a bite of food. <laughs> um, uh, 
the, the grievances that I've read are ma mainly, if you see the, the posters and stuff like that, they're, they're mostly around kind of procedural things like democracy, free elections, lack of rigging of elections and stuff like that. Um, but they probably have a basis, a material basis that the condition, and this goes back to Yusuf's question about how you preserve these remnants of socialism in a capitalist fr framework. They, they're getting um, eroded. Um, lately, um, labor unions are not independent. Um, workers have these uh, contracts that um, they are forced to work. They can't um, with, um, withhold their labor power. A fundamental um, labor uh, thing that, that we'd always say that workers should always have the right to strike and stuff like that. So there's a lot of problems along those, those lines um, that I think lead up to this general discontent. At the same time, the pot is being stirred by long-term NGOs involved in these countries doing what they call leadership training, um, training people for de so-called democracy, training people for free enterprise, and the whole lure of the materialism of, of the West. So th there's a, a complex um, mixture here, and I, and I don't feel in any way adequate to really describe it, um, but it's been a, a syndrome th throughout the former Soviet republics. And as they continually march to the, to the, to the right. In terms of um, overthrowing US imperialism, um, there, we, we're all working on that, but I don't know if there's a, like a single organization that I could point to um, that would end that, but that really is the goal. Um, and that would be liberate not only us, but the world. Alan? Okay. Um... Next will be um, RS. I'm going to ask you to unmute, followed by Sharon, and then Eugene. So uh, RS, if you would go ahead, you've been unmuted. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Yeah. This is Roger Stoll. Um, uh -huh. uh, um, my, uh, mine are sort of a bunch of thoughts, which I want to throw out there. Um, you know, in the in the Western press, we always we always see in these cover, color revolution situations where a government is said to be shaky and its legitimacy is thrown into doubt by mass demonstrations. Um, that seems to be never the case in the West. I mean, we've had over the Iraq war, we had, you know, millions of people marching in the streets of London and Rome. Um, in India, just a year or two ago, I forget when it was, there was like the largest strike, general strike in world history, I believe. Um, but when it's a, a Western government that the U.S. is uh, a, approving of, there, there's never the question of the legitimacy of the government that's 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 ever raised, and I, I don't actually have a have an explanation for that. You know, one possibility is that these governments that we want to overthrow are at least in some way more responsive to their populations. Um, and that's what makes them fragile enough to be uh, to be shaken by by mass demonstrations. Um, and uh, that was sort of a, a, some, some thoughts that I don't really have an answer for. And I wanted to throw that out. Yeah. Roger, did you have a comment? Um, no, but I think what, what Roger is saying about the existential threat um, is, is a, a very profound one um, because um, we have this Black Lives Matter movement here and um, people talking about, well, we have to reform the police, have community control of police, but it doesn't get to the point of saying, well, the whole system has to change. Um, but in these color revolutions, of course, they, looking for a much more fundamental um, change. So I, I think, Roger, you stated it well. Thank you. Alan. OK, next is um, Sharon. I'm going to uh, ask you to unmute, followed by 5513. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, followed by Gene, and then 5513. So Sharon, if you would go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Roger. That was a really great presentation. Um, <clears throat> I, can't, I can't agree with you more. The most important thing for us to do is to be anti-intervention. And um, there may be ways to strengthen the anti-intervention thread in our country. Um, one thing would be is to try to figure out if we can get a speaker from Belarus who is not a, participating in those street demonstrations against the government, might be a supporter of, of the government or maybe a trade union person, I don't know, but it would be really nice if we could get such a person. Um, I'd just like to point out that some people say, some people point out, and I think there's objective truth to this, that actually in, in practice, Trump has been less of an interventionist than many other people you can in, uh, before him. And he actually does have some anti-interventionist policies. Now, those of us who are part of a broad united front to get rid of him should just remember that, that when, what, be careful what we wish for, because when the Democrats get in, they, they are get absolutely going to revert back to a very um, um, overt interventionist policy for all that we look with nostalgia to, to Barack Obama, and I'm one of those people who does, I have to also admit that he was the one who overthrew, with the, with the, at the urging of Hillary Clinton, the overthrew Gaddafi, which was a major, major um, outrageous intervention on the part of the United States, which, which Roger explained the consequences of. Thank you. Good comments, and let's go on to the next one. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, next is uh, Gene. You're, you, uh, did you have a comment? Your hand was up, and then it went down. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't put it down. But, um, yeah, I have a couple things to say. Uh, first of all, Kalingrad. To answer your earlier question, Kalingrad was part of the Soviet Union back in the day when there was a Soviet Union. So I assume that little thing you pointed out uh, is now part of Russia. So I just wanted to uh, say that. I used to teach- You get a before. gold star after your name. <laughs> Pardon me? You get a gold star after All your right. name. All right, <laughs> okay. Um, but but uh, no, I used to teach a course on the Soviet, on the peace-loving Soviet Union when there was a peace-loving Soviet Union. And when it disappeared, I no longer had the emphasis to talk about uh, what was happening there. And I still, trying to figure things out there. Uh, and I appreciate very much so many of you know so much more about that region th than I do. But I I'm also a member of Veterans for Peace, and we have a staunch anti-interventionist position. No U.S. intervention anytime, anywhere. And that's uh, our, our position as Veterans for Peace, and we're still struggling over forming a Russia study group and some other things. So we're very concerned about this. And also, uh, I want to get back to uh, another thing. My own view is, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm supporting uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the Peace and Freedom Party PSL candidate, Gloria Lariva, because she's the only one that really has a staunch anti-interventionist position on all this. And I think uh, she deserves uh, left support. Um, but I also want to mention, uh, America's greatest spiritual advisor, uh, leader, uh, Dr. King said that, you know, we seem to have gotten on the wrong side of a world revolution. And we, and then we need to get back on the right side. And to do that, we need a radical revolution of values. And uh, you can read some of Dr. King's writings and see that he was uh, a socialist. And that's what he advocated. So I just want to uh, pause there and throw that out. Uh, um, and I'll take my gold star and thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, next is uh, 5513, if you would unmute. And I just want to mention before uh, we start with that, if people have questions, raise your hand, go to the participants window and click on the bottom to raise your hand. 
um, and uh, we'll call on you. But 5513, you are muted still. Uh, not sure, how do you unmute on um, phone? What is it, anybody recall? I've asked to unmute. Star nine, uh, maybe? Star no. nine is to Just raise hand nine. and lower it. What is, what is it, Raj? Yeah, can you hear me now? This is yeah, Elazar, my you. new group. We can hear yes. you. Okay. Go ahead. All right. uh, Richard, thank you for the very uh, uh, interweaving of both political and personal themes. Uh, so I have some questions for you, or at least help. It seems to me that the imperialists, mainly headed by U.S., have three major strategies that I can decode right now. Uh, one is encirclement of Russia and China. The second is uh, one by one building NATO bases, approaching uh, these countries or military bases in the case of uh, China in, uh, in, in the Pacific. And the third one is fragmenting and targeting the country, like uh, you mentioned Libya and Ukraine. And actually it was Obama's administration that targeted Ukraine and assisted economically, militarily, and in intelligence, the pro-Nazi fascist forces to overthrow the Yanukovych government. And I would like to know if there are any parallels to that with the attacks uh, on uh, Belarus. Is there any suspicion that demonstrations are tied to the CIA or instruments of that sort? And uh, the, those who remarked that we have to be, uh, Richard, I think, F remarked that we have to be very careful about placing credence on, on uh, anything before we study it very carefully in these demonstrations because the dirty hand of imperialism might be there. So I would like uh, Richard's reaction to that if he notices another modality of imperialist uh, tactics I'd like him to bring that forward. So uh, again, on the remarks that person made about Trump, yes, Trump was trying to strong arm the fascist government of Ukraine that the liberal Democrats brought into being. So uh, those that are going to vote for Joe Biden, who uh, eulogized the most racist senator we've ever had, Strom Thurmond, and was personal pals with Senator Eastland and Senator Talmadge, uh, better think carefully about what they're doing, despite the repugnant, disgusting qualities of Trump. Thank you very much. Okay, Roger, Thank you. And then, and then John will be next. Yeah. Ahead, Roger. So the, the nature of covert actions, of course, is that they're covert. So it's always, always, always hard to see what's, what's happening there. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that we're having a multi-tendency demonstrations out there. There are many, many threads out there. But certainly the, the uh, fingerprints of NATO in the United States and the U European Union is there. For instance, the um, demonstrations um, were about the rigging of the re election, but the, the um, demonstrations began before the election results came out. Um, so that um, suggests that they were planned, and in fact, they were planned uh, far in advance. Um, but the, the extent of, of how much planning there was, it, it, uh, I'm not, I, I haven't read much, much about that. What we do know is that um, National Endowment for Democracy, which is the quasi-governmental um, arm of, of the CIA, um, They've, they've had programs in Belarus uh, for, for decade, for over a decade now, um, as, as have other foreign intelligence groups. And so they've, they've definitely been working in there. Um, to what extent they, they're, they're, they're successful is hard to say, but we see that particularly in the, um, the, the uh, media sophistication of the groups, the, the media sophistication of the, of the um, Opposition is much greater than actually the government in that respect. Their ability to um, there's this, this website Nexta N E X T A um, 
he, he sends out um, responses about three a minute. Um, so they have this huge cadre of people sending out, um, you know, tweets and stuff like that. Um, so it's de definitely th there is the um, element of uh, in interference, but to what extent is the element of interference there? And then I want to go back to Orion's um, initial comment that if there wasn't any general genuine grievances, that all the stirring up the pot won't, wouldn't make any difference. So there are problems as well as um, the stirring up the pot is really the question is what the solutions are. And the, the question has to be answered in the context of what is uh, good for the Belarusian people. Alan? Um, next uh, person is going to be John Walsh. I've asked you to unmute. Others can raise your hand, or some of you are having trouble raising your hand. You can actually privately chat me to express your interest in speaking. I'll put you in the queue. So you can open up the chat window and send me a private chat. Uh, John, you're unmuted. Uh, Go ahead. Um, I'd just briefly like to uh, add to Sharon's comment because it is important in these weeks, and I don't want it to be overlooked. Um, there is a there are many, every, everybody here I think understands, uh, unless I'm mistaken, that the two parties are equivalent. And I hear that again and again, especially when it comes to regime change operations and uh, US striving for hegemony the whole world over. But um, it then goes back very often to, um, well, we, we've got nothing to lose if we vote for Joe. And uh, oh. I think that's not true. And I just want to say, say a few words about that, that there is a problem with doing that. Uh, you do have something to lose. And I think we saw it in the Obama administration, where in the uh, run up during the Iraq war, um, we saw tremendous opposition under Bush. But as soon as Obama came in, that opposition, except in a few, a few among relatively few people, died out. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one is this faith in the, in the Democratic Party, which I don't think we should encourage. And number two is I think there's a psychological factor. And you see this all the time. Uh, people, when they commit to a candidate and say, this is my candidate, when the candidate later on uh, goes on to commit atrocities, it's hard to say, gee, was I dumb? That was really wrong. Loyalty given is, in even the slightest way is not easily taken back. And, uh, and I think, you know, um, we, we saw that also with the pivot to Asia, that the Obama-Biden-Hillary pivot to Asia, which was the launching of an Tense attack on China with 60% of our naval fleet going there and the TPP ginned up to isolate China, that went almost unnoticed. Come along uh, and now it's noticed, but it's been going on for a long while. So I think we have to be very, as a matter of fact, it's more noticed under Trump than under Obama. And there's some opposition so, uh, to it. Minutes, so maybe two minutes if you have a, oh, uh, a question. So, or so maybe there's question. even an advantage in having a president that we uh, feel comfortable in attacking. That's all. Okay. Uh, Very good points, and um, we we should do a whole program on that, that John. So we, we, maybe we need to do uh, more on that. Yeah. Can you hear me now, Raj? Raj, did you? Uh, you know, you can privately, um, if you have a question, you're, you're breaking up, you can actually send it to me and I'll raise your question for you. But go ahead and give it a try, Raj. We can't hear you. You're completely broken up. You're not maybe, even coming through. Raj, another thing you could do, uh -oh. call me up can and I can put you on speakerphone. No, Raj, we can't. You can call uh, Roger and he'll put you on if you want. Call me up uh, my telephone number and then I'll put you on speakerphone. 
Okay, let me, let me, I'd like to make a, a very quick comment, something I, I've actually been following this very closely. I have an interest in it oh. as, uh, as oh. like Roger. But um, what I would like to comment on is the difficulty of getting information about what is going on there. And if you, if you do a Google search, you can turn up, it's very easy to turn up 10 pages of uh, um, so why, why don't you citations in mainstream and I'll, media. I'll ask and, you uh, if the hours. I would just caution people to uh, be careful mm -hmm. about, um, uh, you know, not recognizing the fact that a lot of the information that we get is being filtered. The second thing I would say is this isn't taking place in a vacuum either. And if the United States is able to establish NATO presence uh, in Belarus and really consolidate and put pressure on uh, increasing pressure on Russia, that's not something that takes place in a vacuum. It also has implications all over the world from Venezuela to Palestine to even here in the US. So um, I just want to call that to your people's attention. Why don't we go ahead? Uh, I just wanted to, again, uh, ask people to raise your hand. Some people are, uh, can contact through chat. Orion, if you set it to everyone or to me individually, it'll show up to everyone. You have to change who you set it to. Um, let's go to Youssef, who has had his hand up, and then Gene. Uh, well, uh, this applies in part to the uh, attitude toward bourgeois candidates uh, in the election, uh, uh, but also uh, to uh, uh, such figures uh, as, as Lukashenko, uh, the free, uh, leader in Ukraine, and so on and so forth. They're not, or uh, in some cases, Putin. Um, they are not uh, people uh, 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 that uh, Marxists, that communists, anti-imperialists should uh, support, but we 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 should uh, uh, analyze the situation dialectically in terms of the working class and the global anti-imperialist movement, uh, uh, and avoid the narrative of uh, uh, that imperialism is pushing of demonize of shifting the narrative to the character of this and that uh, a person that they choose to uh, demonize. So uh, it, it, we should uh, regain the uh, narrative as Marxists uh, of using dialectics uh, and, 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 and not saying, oh, are you for Lukashenko or against it? That's the wrong. Uh, uh, so uh, my comment is that, and uh, I, I will uh, ask for feedback on uh, how uh, uh, you feel about this. Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely correct about that. I think that um, the focusing on the individual and the personality of the individual is, um, does, is not a fruitful thing. It's not to say that... Um, these guys have nice personalities or bad personalities, but it's not a very politically fruitful area. Um, and particularly when we start demonizing individuals, and that goes for Trump as well, that we um, fail to understand him politically when we simply see him as a personality. Um, and that particularly um, when we, we, we can call for non-interference in the, the affairs of Belarus, and not be an apologist for one side or the other side. And a good example would be the uh, lead up to the Iraq war, when we had a real mass movement against the Iraq war, but it wasn't a movement in favor of Saddam Hussein. It was a movement against US interference in Iraq. And I think that's what we have to build for Belarus as well. Uh, Alan? Yeah, I'm gonna call on Richard Fallenbaum and then Gene. So Richard, if you would uh, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, well, I just want to make a comment on this question of uh, legitimate, of grievances, uh, whether there were 10,000 people or 100,000. Yes, absolutely there are grievances, but whether they're legitimate grievances is another matter. We know in, you know, in, in, in Venezuela, 
they're the, the, the black, what is the, the tin pot movement in Venezuela has grievances. Uh, but they were the grievances of the upper class, of the wealthy, about some restrictions on their privileges. I think it's the same thing in, in Belarus. You know, you get these young individual, young computer programmers, highly trained. They got the best training in the world. And they, some of them wonder, well, why aren't I making $40 billion like Mark Zuckerberg? Mark Zuckerberg knows hardly anything and he makes 40 billion. Maybe I should, why don't I have the freedom to make that much money? And of course they can't come out and say it exactly. So they, they, they use all this blather about um, uh, democracy and so forth, which, you know, they don't care about, I don't think. But, um, and, and, you know, it's, but, you know, whether that's a legitimate grievance or not is a question. In, in a, some ways, it's a real grievance and it has to be dealt with. And uh, as people have said, there are contradictions between socialism and capitalism and they can't, we, you know, that we, it used to be possible for the, for the socialist countries to isolate themselves at, uh, from the capitalist countries and build themselves. But I think China realized that it, they can't, that they have to, uh, they have to interpenetrate with capitalism and, and deal with it. And um, it's not gonna be easy, but uh, anyway, that's it. Oh, thank you, Richard. Uh, John Walsh, if, if you could look at your chat, please. Um, I sent you a message. Um, yeah, on grievances, particularly in the Belarus, one of the big issues has to be um, similar to Russia Gate here. It's, it's pro and, and anti Russia. Um, so there is a, a real desire, in, particularly in, in the uh, high tech area, to have a more Western facing um, and oriented society rather than a Eastern facing Rus Russian society. Um, that doesn't answer the question, but it gives you a little bit more about the um, c complexity of it. Uh, Alan? Yeah, um, I have a comment uh, from Raj, if uh, anybody cares to respond. Color revolution in Belarus is directed at uh, weakening Russia and eventually China. Um, okay, uh, next no, is- that play, No, no yeah. question about that, that, that um, yeah. is, and I think people have already talked about the NATO encirclement of Russia and China, and that, that fits in very well. Uh, Gene, if you would uh, unmute and um, go ahead. Eugene. Oh, and okay, I'm un unmuted now, right? You're on now. Yeah. yeah. I want to make a couple points. First of all, uh, you know, in terms of the CIA involvement, people talk about the US AID and NED. Uh, as having taken over from the, the, the CIA. In fact, they've taken over the public functions of the CIA and they have a budget in the tens of millions of dollars. However, the CIA still exists and it has a budget in the tens of billions of dollars. And I'm sure that all Mike Pompeo has to do is call up the chief financial officer of the CIA, take a walk on the Potomac, and within hours, there will be, you know, satchels full of, you know, bills there uh, appearing in the uh, Minsk uh, 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 embassy. So I think we need to understand the de de how much power the CIA has, and it's billions of dollars, and we can't find out, uh, uh, trace that in any way. The other thing I wanted to say is uh, I have proposed uh, to this program committee that we devote our program on uh, November 8th, I think, which is the first Sunday after the election, uh, with the topic, what now? Because we all know that uh, we're going to be in, in, in uh, uh, real problem if Trump is elected. And most of us realize we're also going to have in problems if uh, uh, if the other person is elected. And, and um, although I support the, um, you know, uh, uh, settle for Biden if you're in a, in a uh, um, swing state, 
California is not. But, you know, both candidates, I understand, are, you know, palm scum or worse, because at least palm scum has some, um, some ecological function. And these people are just pure evil, both of them. So we need to be organized and we will have, hopefully have a session on that, uh, but we need to continue to think about that. Thank you. Okay, we're getting close to wrapping up. I have one more question from Richard Wright. Richard, if you would uh, unmute yep. and uh, ask your question. I'll get back to the question that wasn't answered. Okay. <laughs> And that was, uh, I heard that there was a deal cut between uh, Putin and Lukashenko. And I was wondering uh, uh, if, if, if uh, 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 anybody knows the details of that deal, uh, what, what each side got out of it. Thanks. Yeah, there's a longstanding agreement called the Union State Agreement that was signed in 2000, which is calls for the uh, supranational national entity in, uh, integrating Belarus and, and Russia. Um, and it involves ba basically the, making them almost a, the same country. Um, and that would strengthen the anti-NATO forces, but it would be, but it, it's, it's a difficult one to, to achieve. Um, in the context right now of, of Belarus, when you read the press, they mainly discuss the, that, that issue as something to do with uh, Lukashenko's personality, that he's power hungry and unwilling to give up power to Putin. Um, th there's a much deeper um, issue there. And that is that many people in Belarus don't like the Soviets, I mean, the Russians, just like in the United States. Um, and particularly the people that are demonstrating right now really are looking for kind of um, a Western oriented um, NATO type alliance. So it would be a difficult thing for, for, uh, for Lukashenko to move closer to Russia. On the other hand, um, surviving and, and, the, the syst and preserving parts of the, of, the, of the remnant socialist system um, that seems to be the key to it. So right right now there is an imp impasse and a difficult one to to overcome. I, ho I hope that begins to answer that question. Come on. Okay, yeah. it's uh, twelve thirty now. So what I'm going to do is first I want to thank Roger for his presentation. I want to thank everybody for participating in today's discussion. It was a very good discussion. Uh, I don't think you can get this kind of uh, information and discussion anywhere uh, besides right here at the uh, Marxist Library. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and Alan, I, open I, I, it. Could, yeah, could I make a, a final? Oh, sure. Comment? Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Right. Um, and, and this is not about Belarus, but it's about a comrade that a week ago today passed away. And that is Kevin Zeese. And I think many of you may have heard about Kevin, Kevin Zeese. Um, he was, um, had a blog site called Popular Resistance, and he was really one of the major giants in our movement and a great, great loss. Uh, John, I, I, you, you wrote quite eloquently about him. Would you like to say anything? Uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot about Kevin. I, I think you have to un unmute John. Okay, um, I, I, I don't know. I did write something about him briefly, and uh, uh, actually, I think uh, I can. Given all he did and and how principled he was, you know, the uh, in cases like this, as I said in the the little bit I wrote, it's the. Uh, it reminds me of uh, what uh, Mao Zedong said on the uh, at the eulogy to Norman Bethune that. Some deaths fall on us like the, with the weight of a feather and others with the weight of a mountain. Bethune's was with the weight of a mountain and so was, so was Kevin's. And uh, not only was he smart and uh, hardworking and principled, but he was also effective. That's important that the action that he and a few other people 
took it to the uh, Venezuelan embassy, brought that matter to the attention of the world. That was very effective. And it was courageous. He faced the possibility of a lot of prison time, which they managed to uh, elude the government on. And uh, I, I was first involved closely with Kevin about 10 years ago when, uh, and I'll introduce, uh, when we tried to uh, put together an anti-interventionist group that spanned both right and left. And there were, Ralph Nader was there at the initiation of that and Katrina Van Newell and many others. Unfortunately, uh, that was a dream of Kevin's that remains a dream of mine. And uh, I think that we all have to try to think a little bit about the building of that kind of an anti-interventionist movement that's Catholic with a low C. That's it. Thank you, John. Kevin Zies, oh. Presente. And thank you very much for joining us today. I'm gonna to hand it back to Alan. Okay. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S -U -N -D -A -Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609 or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info, for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org. Thank you.